everybody. Um, welcome to this keynote with Darren Lanier. Um, I'm glad that we're back. There was a slight mix up at the time, but we're super happy to be presenting this to you now. So my name is Avital and I work with Radical Exchange. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker to you tonight. Um, I remember about three years ago when I was home for the summer, my mom cut out a clipping from the New York Times, which she frequently does. And it was an interview with Darren. And it was actually the first piece of what I'd call technology philosophy that I had ever read. And I love that interview because um, Jaren has such a way of speaking to what our relationship to technology could be um, and how it's currently falling short of that. Um, and over the past couple of years, I've been continuously impressed with Jaren's writing and thinking. And one of my favorite things is that he considers himself an optimist and that he doesn't just proclaim a coming dystopian future. He criticizes current implementation implementations of technology but he still believes in their promise. Um, and Darren is no armchair philosopher when it comes to digital technology. His work has given him quite the authority on it. He's coined the terms virtual rea reality and mixed reality, and he's worked in some of the earliest implementations of those. Um, the first VR startup manufacturing VR headsets and gloves um, back in his youth in the 80s. He also was a chief scientist for Internet2, the academic consortium charged with making sure the internet would scale. Um, he has written many fabulous books, including You Are Not a Gadget, Who Owns the Future, and 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. He's also won many awards, including the IEEE Lifetime Achievement Award, the German Peace Prize for Books, one of the highest literary honors, and multiple honorary PhDs. In 2018, Wired named Jaren one of the 25 most influential figures in tech from the previous 25 years. Um, Jaren is also an instrument, or is also, he's not an instrument, he is a human. Jaren um, is a musician specializing in unusual and obscure instruments. And in the last year, he played with Sarah Burai and T-Bone Burnett on a number one single, appeared on Colbert playing with John Batiste, and collaborated with Philip Glass. And officially, Jaren is Microsoft's octopus, which is one of my personal favorite animals, um, which stands for <laughs> Office of the Chief Technology Officer, Prime Unifying Scientist. Try to get a job title cooler than that. Um, and a few practical things. There'll be a question and answer period at the end of this session. So please submit um, your questions. If you're watching this umbrella, you'll see a place to do that right next to the screen. Um, and you can upload other people's questions so that Jaren is able to answer um, some of the most popular ones at the end. So now we are so pleased to welcome Jaren and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Avital. Uh, so, oh, Sarah's the musician you mentioned is Barella, Sarah Barella. That's how she pronounces it. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got to butcher yeah. a few things. Yeah, that thing actually was number one for a week last summer for a while. Uh, anyway, hey, so I'm sorry to be an hour late. Um, the way you have this set up, I can't tell if anybody's um, out there or uh, see them. Once in a while, you can see people gathered, but um, I'm going to presume that there's somebody listening. Right now, all I see is you, so I'll speak to you, I guess. Uh, um, it's a little late for me. It's been a really long day. I'm in Calif I'm in Berkeley, California, and uh, we just had our uh, Juneteenth protest out here. Um, the, uh, the atmosphere is so strange because you walk out and there's this Thing like, oh, you liberals in Berkeley, we're going to challenge you. So if you're wearing a mask, there are people who come up and yell at you and stuff. And it's it's just the the weirdest, most insane world we live in. So, um, well, <laughs> where to begin? I've been concerned for quite some time that we we did the internet and computer science in general kind of backwards, and I believe we can still fix it and it'll be better. Uh, the very short version of how it's messed up is uh, the people in tech tend to be mostly interested in the artificial intelligence paradigm, which is a way of thinking that technology is this thing that is apart from people, or at least will be apart from people, and is becoming a creature. And as this creature rises, it'll get uh, smarter than us, or at least take over in a lot of ways, and that our future has to do with our relationship with it, whether it destroys us, like in the movies, or whether it um, makes us immortal, like in the movies, or whatever it might do, like in the movies. And then in the service of that idea, we have um, 
mixed in some other ideas that really weren't so great in my view. Um, one of them is this weird conflicting desire that existed in the hacker community um, in the earliest days of the internet to that loved kind of socialism and capitalism at the same time without thinking about how to combine them at all. So the socialism love was like the open source movement and the idea that everything should be free online and everything should be volunteer and it's good to share and everything should be a wiki and you should give and take online and everything. And there's this very, very strong feeling for that. But the capitalism idea was this kind of um, obsession with Silicon Valley type entrepreneurship and success. So the worship of people like Steve Jobs, this idea that everybody has to have a startup. I had startups. I've done, I, I've done well with startups, um, but there, there was this kind of weird combo of the things. And so the only resolution that ever came up was the Google one, which was, we'll, um, we'll give you the stuff for free, but in exchange, we'll take your data and then we'll make money on the side with advertising. Now, that was the first story. The problem with the advertising idea is that computers get better and better and they're interactive. So you start with an idea like advertising where it'll be like, oh, we'll put up um, a link to your local dentist who you might not know about or something. And that was not a problem. However, it evolved because the algorithms got more sophisticated, the computers got faster because of Moore's law, the net got more higher bandwidth and more reliable, everything just kind of amped up and amped up. And it gradually turned into um, a behavior modification loop, which is different from advertising because in advertising, the advertisement isn't watching you. As soon as there's a feedback loop and what you experience is influenced by an attention and persuasion scheme, then it changes into something different and it becomes dystopian. Um, as a historical note, uh, the very first experience ever implemented of somebody using a computer that was networked to other computers at distances was B.F. Skinner, the famous behaviorist who, who did try to implement a behavior modification loop and thought that computer networks would finally be the way to behavior modify people so they'd behave and get in line and society would be controlled, something I find it astonishingly creepy. So unfortunately, um, the idea of a digital network uh, <laughs> it has quite a history. The first person to describe it in any detail was in 1907, and that's Ian uh, e. Forster's The Machine Stops, which is the prototype for all the dystopian science fiction movies about the net, like the Matrix movies and all that. It has, they all follow the same general outline of The Machine Stops. And he got everything. He got dystopian Facebook and bugs and the whole everything. He got it all in 1907, decades before Turing. And then the next person to describe it was the famous, uh, as we may think, uh, the, the story in the Atlantic about how you could do computers to enhance thought, which is fine. Then the one after that, 1960, Ted Nelson does this very, in my view, enlightened first pass at a digital network ever, in which he imagines one that people could make a living on in the future when robots do all the work, and they'd all get royalties and chains where people's stuff could be reused. And it would be, uh, it was a really cool idea. He called it Xanadu eventually. But then the first one actually implemented goes back to the dystopia. It goes to, to this one I just described, the um, uh, B.F. Skinner one, which, and so it's, it's kind of interesting that all of the different ideas about whether the net the network would be used to control people or whether people would use it to their own benefit in a knowing transparent way. All of these things actually were in play and in discussions before the network even worked, you know? But then unfortunately the first out of the gate was the creepy one. But getting back to Google, <laughs> um, Google proposed this kind of two level thing where people on people would experience socialism. They would, they would give freely, they would take freely but Google would become rich because it would be paid by these other people who were off to the side who were called the advertisers. But as I say, the whole thing amped up into behavior modification. So they're really more the manipulators in my view. They, we, you can draw a bright line between advertising and behavior manipulation because of the feedback loop. Does it exist or not? As soon as there's a real-time feedback loop, 
that's being used to calculate ex your experience. It's no longer advertising and it moves into behavior mod. So, but then um, Google said, we're not, an, you know, Wall Street thinks we're an advertising company. We're not, we're an AI company. The whole reason we're doing this is we're getting all of this data to make AIs. And then Google's PR department <laughs> started spitting out these things almost daily. Oh, you know, the news might be terrible. The country's falling apart. The world is being destroyed by climate change and all this, but the bright spot is there's a robot that'll be able to do your job and replace you. <laughs> and it's just, there was this kind of weird rhetoric that's, that started coming out of, out of uh, Silicon Valley. And then they hired my, my old friend, Ray Kurzweil, who's into getting a mortal inside a big computer someday and all this stuff. And it, there, there started to be this emergence of almost like a religion, like the most exalted and, and richest companies are gonna replace people and that we're all engaging in this sort of ritual of giving them our data in order to create human replacement. And I think it's part, it's only one part, but it's one small part of why so many people feel that the modernity is against them because every day on the news, it appears so. Um, money concentrates more and more and more around the biggest computers. And then what the people who are right at the center of the biggest computers say is that they're gonna replace humans. And it sure sounds like the whole game is rigged against you if you're a human out there and you're not in the tech world. So um, this is all really stupid. Um, I The usual ways I would say it's stupid would focus on how it's evil, but I'm actually just, I'm not gonna focus on how it's evil because I think that's apparent. I wanna focus a little more on how it's stupid for the moment. And so uh, there's, a, there's a funny way, even though it sounds, very modern and 21st century, it's actually locked in the 19th century uh, in, in a particularly stupid way. And I wanna explain the 19th century lock. So when the industrial revolution happened and factories became important, there was this drive to treat the factory worker kind of like a robot. There was a notation to describe worker motion that would optimize what the worker's supposed to do. Like the, the worker was supposed to be like this mechanical part. Um, and that notation actually turned out to have another use. It's actually used by choreographers today, but it started out as a way to ro roboticize people in, uh, in factories. And the thing about factories is that for a long time, they turned out poor quality items. So for instance, uh, cars, made in fact, which were exclusively made in factories, uh, essentially, um, were pretty unreliable. They broke down all the time. Now, a very interesting thing happened in Japan after its defeat in World War II. Japan had a reputation at, at the rock bottom of quality in industrial production. It was a joke. It was thought of as making the most junky, unreliable stuff. I don't know who has that reputation today. Uh, maybe nobody, in fact. I think we've kind of got, learned how to make things a little better. Now, uh, the Japanese made contact, and I'm not exactly, I'd love to know the detailed micro story of exactly how this happened, but they made contact with a really interesting scientist and engineer named Deming, uh, whom some of you might've heard of. So this is a guy who had been interested in just from a scientific point of view of why factories couldn't turn out better stuff. The previous question had always been, how can you make factory production cost less and how can you get them to make more stuff? But he looked at it and he said, no, no, let's look at the quality question. How can we get better stuff? And he developed this idea of quality, which it's usually just known as quality, although they're descendants of it with different names like Six Sigma and, and whatnot. And there are a few different parts of his recipe for improving quality. Um, some of them are very quantitative, where he's saying, look, don't just pretend, gather real data. Gather real data about how things perform and use the data to inf inform how you improve the manufacturing process. That makes that seems totally normal to us today, but at the time it was kind of shocking. Like data, like we're gonna work with truth, wow. So it kind of blew people's minds, like this idea that you could actually use measurement and data in the real world instead of just in, you know, dusty laboratory somewhere. Um, there's another part that's kind of about culture, which is kind of cool and kind of goofy. He would like say factory workers should be happy. They should be bonded. They should sing songs like kids in kindergarten in the morning and stuff. So that's another part. But there was a third part, which is what I want to focus on here. 
what he was saying is factory workers aren't robots. They're humans and they're not dumb. And why don't we engage their brains to make things better? So if a car breaks down somewhere, don't hide the information, share it with the actual people on the factory line, because they are the ones who are right there while the thing's being made, and they're best able to use the information and listen to them. And they might have ideas. Oh, I'm being joined by a cat. Um, so you're not seeing the cat here. Um, it's a kind of a shy cat. Starlight, do you want to say hello to the radical exchange people? Okay. Oh. She's the sweetest cat ever. Anyway, um, we have four cats here. We have uh, more cats than humans, but the humans stay controlled through a quirk in the electoral college. And so we've been able to maintain a human oriented household pattern to some to a slight degree. Actually, they're they're protesting and gaining on us every day. So anyway, um, the um, the Japanese adopted Deming's principles and they started to say, we're going to bring in information from the field, show it to the workers, and the workers are going to be able to suggest ways to improve things. And what Deming said is, when you treat people as people, not only will you make the product better, that you'll also spread dignity in, in the world because people will start to feel that they're actually part of this thing they're making rather than a, a, a simulated robot and they'll start to They'll start to feel pride in it. They'll start to feel connected to it. And so um, they start, companies like Toyota implemented this in the 50s. And it worked like crazy. Suddenly, Japan's reputation moved from the worst manufacturer to the best manufacturer in terms of quality. And uh, companies like Toyota and, and, and Honda and so forth just became massive global forces. And it created a recipe for the economic rise of first Japan and then the Asian tigers and then eventually even China. They created the recipe for, uh, for the rise of Asia that has transformed the world. So it, it was an incredibly globe shaking idea. Okay, now <laughs> I, I've described this because I want, I, 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 what's amazing to me is that companies like Google have not caught up because the way AI works right now is you, you give people free service like some social networking thing or a video hosting service or whatever. And then you grab all their data and then you use their data and stuff it into algorithms. But the people don't know that their data is being used for algorithms. They don't know what the algorithms do. They are very much like 19th century workers who are totally divorced from the actual product that they're part of creating. And then uh, <laughs> it's really weird. And so if it worked for Toyota, why won't it work for Google? Like why not, instead of having this sneaky thing where we're gonna sneakily take your data, you're not gonna know what the data is used for. And then we're gonna do this AI thing. Isn't that fundamentally profoundly just stupid? It was stupid in the 19th century and it's still stupid in the 21st century. Um, and the, you know, the much better idea is transparency where the person whose data is being used is saying, oh, they need data because they don't want the self-driving car to run into a bicycle. All right, so right now what we do, Google has you do eCAPTCHA where you pick out the bicycles in order to get into something, but you don't know what it's for. What if you said, wait a second, this is stupid. The reason you run over bicycles is because people are, are are sloppy about how they leave their bikes and the bikes fall on the street and all that. Like people who have actual real world knowledge could contribute such better corpus data for these algorithms and people who don't know what they're doing. So why not make it an example of collaborative intelligence instead of obs obscured opaque theft? I mean, why not do that? Wouldn't it make everything better? And so I, as far as why we're doing this thing so stupidly, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, part of it is commercial bad incentives where if you admit that other people contribute to something, then maybe they are owed some money. Now, um, I'm working with a company that's bigger and more profitable than Google. Thank you very much. And I, I'm not, I have no allergy to big corporations. I think that there is a need for big entities in our big world. I, I don't think that that's a bad thing in itself. But if we're gonna be a big corporation, we have to actually believe some of the, we have to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk of, of, of market ideology. And so in market ideology, 
if somebody gets paid and they have some capital to spend, it, it raises all boats. It's expanding the economy. Uh, even Henry Ford, who was a, a lousy, vicious fascist, realized that if he didn't pay workers well enough to buy cars, there wasn't going to be there weren't going to be many cars sold. I mean, at some point, you have to actually believe in the market. So, the idea that we pay people for data as part of making data better does not scare me. It just means there'll be more people to buy, you know, Xboxes. I, I like. I actually don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. the the prop The reason that that's that very simple idea is so hard to grasp, I think, for some of the companies is the weird way that they don't have direct customers. Like if, if, if most of your users are in this fake socialism and your real customers are off to the side and are only are the advertisers, then you don't enter into this way of thinking about markets in a normal way. Everything's kind of askew. Because in that case, those people out there who you get the data from, if they got money, you don't even think of them as potential customers. You're not selling anything to them. So you don't, you've lost track of the magic of markets because you've gotten into this fake market. So, and by the way, I'm not anti Google. I've sold a company to Google just to be clear. And I, I, I keep up socially with the founders once in a while and stuff. And I, I don't think they're bad. They're cool. I, I always really enjoyed them. I think they kind of fell into it by mistake. It's like the frog getting boiled very slowly. Like I think, they fell into it like, oh, well, okay, we'll, we'll be free with ads. And then it was just like this gradual thing. And one step led to another until they're in this absurd position where they're, they're neither a real company in a capitalist sense, nor some kind of a social service. They're just kind of this weird control entity. And it's, it's very sad to me because I actually like the people a lot. Anyway, um, now... <coughs> Could we implement a Deming quality control <clears throat> for AI? Well, we're trying. We're trying to prototype it. We have a beta running at Microsoft that hints at it called Trove, um, where people can understand what their data is for, being used for. <coughs> Pardon the cough. It is not COVID. I just had some popcorn before speaking, and I got a bit of a dry throat from hot popcorn. It's a very good reason to have a cough, a much better reason than getting COVID-19. All right, so uh, we're trying it. I think there's a lot of invention, a lot of testing, a whole process needed to get from where we are to where we need to be. But I think we can get there and it's totally worth it. Now, I've just described a way that um, companies like Google and Facebook are stuck in the 19th century. Now, I want to describe another thing that's stupid where they haven't taken advantage of an innovation that's really from only uh, two or three decades ago, but is equally important. So I first want to describe a problem which is extremely familiar, <coughs> which is uh, platforms like the various Facebook brands, um, WhatsApp and, and, and so on, and Google and its various brands like YouTube and Twitter. Um, all these things, they end up having to be the police of culture, where people will say, well, you can't just let, you know, you know, human traffickers operate freely. You can't let hate the haters go. You can't let the sadists, you can't let, you can't do this and that. You can't let people just lie. And um, because when, when it's used by the powerful to promote lies, especially given the interactive nature of it, it, it has a way of doing enormous harm and um, the harm is so profound. I mean, um, the, uh, the attention and persuasion mechanism that the, the behavior modification loop runs on, um, as it self-optimizes just through math, it naturally discovers the most sensitive points of contact in, in the human psyche. And those happen to be the fight or flight responses. And so since it engages them over and over again, it tends to be optimized for highlighting um, uh, fight or flight responses, which in the diffuse version you get online turn into uh, paranoia and irritability. So you tend to have conspiracy theories, you tend to have uh, people selected to be hated and so on. And you just see this pattern over and over and over and over again. 
the internet didn't invent these things. It's just optimized to pick them out and highlight them more than would naturally be the case. They've always been a problem in human character and culture. It's just that now we're building financial empires on making them worse. And so if there's this whole financial structure that incentivizes making them worse than they've been. Um, I was in Brazil in the Bolsonaro election, and that was all about misuse of WhatsApp. It was all about um, false, false, uh, falsities and paranoia and weird clan emotions. And now, um, because the whole thing's based on falsities and paranoias and weird clan emotions, Brazil is um, possibly, with the exception of Iran, enacting the stupidest COVID response in the world. It might even be surpassing Iran and COVID stupidity. And this is a shame because Brazil is not, it wasn't some kind of theocratic uh, dictatorship like Iran. It was, um, you know, it's a place with a lot of, you know, it's a, it's an amazing country with amazing institutions and amazing, like, it's, this should not be happening in Brazil. It's just like a tragedy. And it's, I just have to say bluntly, it's Facebook's fault. I think they have blood on their hands to an astonishing degree. But, and it's not exclusively their fault. I mean, they don't, they didn't make Bolsonaro be born, but they, they definitely are changing the atmosphere to empower people like that. Um, and there's so much more to say about that. I, I, um, part of it has to, it's, it's possible humanity will gradually just sort of get used to this stuff enough that it won't be as potent. Uh, Hitler came to power <clears throat> in part because he was so good at using media that were somewhat uh, new. Like, without modern media, it wasn't even really possible to quickly organize massive rallies. And with the earliest things like radios, it became possible to organize them. Uh, he did some of the first television. He did uh, some of the early propaganda cinema. So, um, and all of those things we kind of got inured to after a while. So there, it's important to say that some of these things are time frame based. But anyway, I want to get back to the stupid thing from a few decades ago that could save the platforms from having to be the arbiters of culture. I don't envy uh, Twitter and Google and Facebook for the situation they're in where, where they can't keep the worst stuff off their platforms. Um, another thing is uh, apparently more than half of the comments on Twitter about COVID are from bots. And now I've seen some academics who are saying, oh, but that's not important. But then I read how they talk and they're classic Twitter addicts. So I'm skeptical of them dismissing the importance of that fact. But I'm now going to talk about somebody named Mohammed Yunus and microlending and the Grameen Bank. Maybe some of you have heard of these things and you might wonder what on earth does this have to do with anything? Well, if it's not immediately obvious, I will explain it. First of all, what is this stuff? Okay, so Mohammed Yunus won a Nobel Prize a while ago and he's somebody I know and uh, the, the deal is he was concerned with the problem of how can you finance development in very poor parts of the world because finance depends on credit and credit depends on trust. And if you have a bunch of very poor people, how do you decide which ones to trust to finance development? Because the alternative model of finance of development being imposed from the outside has been shown not to work. You can't just go in and say, we will, we will put it in a McDonald's, you will not own it, you will be happy. People will burn down that McDonald's or one well, more recently a Wendy's. That, that's not a good form of development. People have to own what they live with. They have to own their built environment. They have to be invested in it. That's civilization, not, you know, as opposed to colonization. So how do you do it? Well, the way you do it is fascinating. You cannot have the bank go and evaluate each person because how are they going to know? They have no information. It would become infinitely expensive to develop trust pro profiles for every person in a poor population. What you do is you get them to form groups through free association and they vouch for each other and they take collective responsibility for their debts. So you'll say, okay, there are eight women with a market stall where they sell cloth that they make. They're going to get a loan and each one is independently going to take full responsibility for the whole thing. So they'll become, they'll vouch for each other and they'll, be, they'll take on a shared credit rating, essentially. Now, the interesting thing about this is it distributes the process of trust instead of centralizing it. And as soon as you have that, and it's through free association, so there might be a group of people who get together with the purpose to defraud, but then they're marked. 
because they actually have developed ad credit for themselves. So that only works once. And the result of this experiment was kind of spectacular. The Grameen Bank, the test bank for doing this, uh, had spectacularly good repay rates, much better than is typical in the banking industry. And so distributed trust was proven. Now I have to say the whole story is more complex. The criticisms of microlending, it's no more perfect than any other human system. There's no such thing as a perfect human system. There's no such thing as the perfect marketplace or the perfect socialist utopia. None of these things can ever, they're all gonna be flawed because we're screwed up and systems are hard. So those, those are the two reasons. But for those reasons, none of these things can, will be perfect. But this thing is kind of impressive. So um, this idea of distributing trust it's fascinating because it promotes capitalism and democracy at the same time in a piece together. So, you know, Peter Thiel was wrong. Capitalism and democracy do not have to be at loggerheads. They can coexist peacefully. And this is a wonderful mechanism in which they do. And it also removes this impossible burden from some central authority that, that they can't, not, they're not equipped to take on. So this, I hope this is, it's starting to be obvious why what we're doing with, with making uh, platforms like Google and Facebook, the arbiters of culture, why this is stupid. What should happen is instead of posting as individuals, people should, through free association, never being forced, form themselves into groups and create essentially little brands or little bands of, of, together, or maybe big ones. And they post vouching for each other with their brand. And if their brand gets ruined because somebody posts hate speech, falsehoods, deep fakes, um, whatever, or just extremely boring material that nobody wants. If their brand sinks, they all sink together. So they vouch for each other and they create quality. Now this idea of groups of people through free association getting together to create quality is an ancient idea. It, it's, it's what was going on when uh, Pythagoras had a school uh, it's what was going on uh, in, in throughout civilizations when people band together to just create some sense of quality. It happened in medieval guilds. It happens in a soccer club. It happens in a journal. It happens in a school. It happens in a band. It happens in all kinds of things. This is the way that people create quality because it's only through people vouching for each other and, and creating a sort of a, a brand that someone else can get some sense of confidence that they're worth paying attention to or listening to. These are called societal institutions. And when scholars throughout history, throughout deep history have looked at what makes a human society functional instead of decrepit or horrible, they always focus on this idea of the societal institution. This thing that's not centralized, but it's also not just a bunch of atomized individuals competing. It's, it's, a, it's a collection. Capitalism absolutely depends on these things. Um, if you're talking, if you believe in a capital labor divide, which I think will start to dissolve at some point in the future, but if you believe in that, then on the capital side, we call these things corporations or professional partnerships. We create a little bubble in which people are not competing each against each, but have local cooperation, but they also have local codependence where they have a brand together that, they're, that they have a reason not to screw up. Um, and uh, if you believe on the, if, if you believe in that divide, then on the labor side, we call this a labor union, which has um, a, similar, a similar sort of a thing. We like some labor unions better than others. At the moment, I'm pretty pissed off at the police unions, for instance, uh, but I love, I love a lot of unions, I really do. And so, and I love a lot of corporations. I don't think these things are in conflict. They've been set up to be in conflict, but there's no reason. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I just got a note saying. Well, Rita, I was just saying we, you've amassed quite a number of audience questions. Okay. So definitely yeah. wrap up, I, take however long you want, but you definitely can switch to questions whenever I can you want. Start to, okay. All right. I, I, there, I'm a problematic speaker in that sometimes I can't go on. So um, I'll try to wrap this up quickly. So um, there's a kind of an interesting uh, consilience here between a few different ideas. If we want to take advantage of the, the amazing decentralizing power that Muhammad Yunus discovered for uh, credit worthiness, instead of having people post as individuals, they should post as members of societal groupings of some sort. They could be small, they could be large. So I think the idea of individual posting, and by the way, that, that also solves the problem 
do people need anonymity? You could have a brand that includes anonymity. I mean, that's what WikiLeaks does. I think WikiLeaks brand has suffered, however, but you could have good ones. Um, and you could, um, so that solves that problem of Facebook and Google having to be arbiters. It solves that whole weird millennium copyright. It's a better solution than the current one of who gets to sue when positive incentives are better than a lot of lawsuits after the fact. It's, it's just a smarter way to build a civilization. So this would align incentives with goodness instead of ugh, what we're doing. All right. And then another, I, I was talking about how data collection for algorithms is trapped in the 19th century um, and hasn't learned the lessons that Toyota <laughs> demonstrated in the post-war years. Um, if people are going to be, uh, are, are going to know about their data, they have to be paid. And just like you get better quality cars from union factories, you do. Um, you have the people who provide data have to unionize so the price of data doesn't drive down to zero. Um, Facebook has created this um, extensive rhetoric about how if you paid people for data, it would amount to nothing. If we have your data, it's worth trillions of dollars, but if you have it, it's worth nothing. And they're right. And the reason why is they have a monopoly and you have no market power because you're in an each against each competition that drives the price down to zero. As soon as you have a union, then you also have power and then it'll be worth something instead of nothing. And so if you need groupings of people for quality and you need groupings of people for payment not to drop to zero, make them the same. And this is the idea of what's called the mid sometimes. Uh, Glenn Weil and I wrote a paper calling the mids in the Harvard Business Review that you can't get because it's behind a paywall. For, so just to increase the irony of everything. Um, and uh, sometimes they're called uh, data trusts. There are all kinds of names. There are a lot of different ideas about how it would work. But you can combine these ideas and imagine a world where instead of a bunch of atomized people and a few giant hubs that are created because of network effects. Instead, you have collections of people who form together and have real power and you start to have a real society again that's quality oriented and can actually have transparency because it's not sneaky anymore. All right, that seems like enough. I can take questions. Thank you so much, Darren. That was a lot packed into that and I don't know if we'll be able to touch on everything you brought up. Um, <laughs> There's certainly I was, only, I was only glazing the, a little tiny scratch of the surface of this body of ideas. It's a whole, it's a whole worldview that, uh, yeah. Uh, well, the first of our questions is about um, something that you bring up a lot in your books about how you don't seem to blame the people who make this technology. You don't believe that they're inherently evil people or that they necessarily have malicious intent. I mean, you've worked with many of them, you've been one of them, um, but it's more that the economic logic of their project of their products sort of lock them into behaving huh. a certain way. Um, but then where does the responsibility lie with fixing these products? Yeah. Like, is it with I mean, this whole question of who to think poorly of is a tricky one. So I know a lot of these people, so I, I do tend to have opinions about them. Like, um, I feel like Jack Dorsey's really doing his best and he's trapped in a maze. That's kind of my feeling. Peter Thiel, Creeps me out. I mean, he's a friend. I keep up with him. He creeps me out. He he knows. I think he creeps me out. Um, we had a fun thing one time where, where he was invited to. I don't know if if any of you are Jewish, you'll know what a seder is. And we had we had him play the pharaoh and had the kids pelt him with plagues, little stuffy plagues. And he was like, "Why why am I being pelted with plagues?" I said, "Well, because you're creeping us out," you know. <laughs> and um, uh, Anyway, uh, so, you know, I have different opinions about the people, but um, most, most people are, the people in the circle on Facebook, I think, let it get to their heads. And I think the people in, in Google just kind of got drawn in and are sort of, I think they're a little blinkered about AI, but I don't think they are, they're on power trips in the same way that some of the fa Facebook related people kind of got on power trips. Um, and uh, I'm not really sure, you know, I can't see into people's souls. I, I try to, I've tried to do this thing of staying in the community and staying in the industry, but just trying to speak honestly to everybody and, you know, keep my, my meal, my meal pass or whatever it is. That I, I somehow have just tried to just be honest. And part of the honesty is that I'm not really sure what goes on inside people's heads. You know, I don't, um, 
I'm, but, but you know what, this question of who to think poorly of is not that functional of a question because like you could think poorly of somebody and they could quit or die or something and that doesn't necessarily help. Like the, the important thought isn't really that stuff. The important thought is how can we systemically turn the incentives around and make this thing better in a way that's not likely to turn into some power trip that ruins yet another generation of people. That's really the key question, and um, everything everything else is just mammalian bullshit, you know. <laughs> that that sounds about right, um, <laughs> and it's it's aptly put. Uh, my next question is about science fiction and whether you have any favorite authors, particularly any that feature positive vision. Oh God, that's such a good question. Um, uh, oh my God. Well, you know, I mentioned E.M. Forster and The Machine Stops. I think it's the best science fiction story that has been done thus far. I think it transcends almost everything. And then, of course, I mean, you know, the usual, the Philip K. Dick and whatnot. And, and um, I'm I'm biased where the, the cyberpunk generation, uh, Bill Gibson and Neil Stevenson are friends, and my head floats around in the Neil Stevenson virtual worlds and stuff, so I can't, I can't speak objectively about them. Um, I found the Warshawskis of the Matrix movies, you know, very um, kind of uh, impressive and and uh, deeply wrought. And all that, I mean, I think these are just obvious things that anybody would say. Um, I, uh, but this positivity question though is really a profound one. Neil Stevenson tried to put together a uh, anthology of more positive science fiction recently because there has been this weird, scary lack of positivity in science fiction for a while. And in fact, uh, and he kind of got it. I, I failed to give him a piece and I feel bad about it, but I'm not really a fiction writer, so it's just hard. But um, uh, he, um, and Bill Gibson has been talking about how nobody's talking about the 22nd century, like we've just lost the future. The way I put it in my book, Who Owns the Future is that I miss the future, that, that, that like there used to be the sense of the future and it just has kind of gone away because things have just felt like they're closed off and, and hopeless. and um, the last time, so what you want from optimistic uh, science fiction is the sense that as technology advances, so do, so does a sense of ethics and morality and meaning and quality and joy and civilization. Um, Gene Roddenberry in uh, Star Trek and, and particularly The Next Generation and its related shows, I think actually got it with flaws, you know, it's kind of, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like, it's a ridiculous show with people in rubber masks and all that, but I think there's this thing in it where he actually profoundly got this sensibility, which is, which is so precious and so rare. And um, I, uh, I, I, I think it's something we need, we need so badly. Um, I have another friend who just did one of the recent, who just wrote and produced one of the, um, one of the recent Star Trek uh, series, and I. I know he was going for it, maybe partially got there. I'm thinking of uh, Michael Chabon and the the, uh, the recent Picard um, series. You know, it's a little, it's it's getting there a little bit. I think it's really hard to do. It's so essential though. I just, I w there should be a prize for just positive science fiction. Like that should be a thing. Anyway, that's a, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, my next question is about, um, an idea from one of your books that I particularly liked, which is about love as a form of behavior modification. I, in the Silicon Valley world, there can often be this kind of extreme strain of libertarianism that sort of rejects our connections to other people or communities. And I found it really interesting that you held up a positive idea of how behavior modification isn't inherently bad. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Right, yeah. Um, it's important. Um, it's important to get these uh, lines right. So you could take the criticism of people putting people in behavior modifications loops and say, oh, this is a horrible thing. And that would be quite wrong because the truth is um, as humans, part of what we do is we behavior modify each other. And when we're in relationships, we become each other's behavior modification loops. When we learn we're doing behavior mo modification looping on ourselves. Like it's not that that thing that can happen can be beautiful. It's not something to hide from. It's not something to be embarrassed by. It's not intrinsically creepy at all. But the problem is hijacking it for a very petty, narrowly designed, uh, vaguely designed purpose for 
Um, and in particular, it has to be said that like if you design these online bots to influence the conversation and try to change the atmosphere, the easiest thing to do is to bring about a sense of dystopia and pessimism and uh, paranoia and irritability in a, in, a, in a culture. It doesn't, like that's what happens most naturally because of the fight or flight responses. So um, sort of a cheap use of these things is, is uh, really degrading. Um, and that's, that's what we're doing online. Fantastic. Um, the final question that I think we'll have time for is there have been multiple requests for a musical performance. Oh, so yeah. if you have if you have any instruments at hand, we would love it. I uh, here I can I'll turn I don't know if this uh, I have instruments everywhere in my house. <laughs> I have uh, I have like uh, there's a couple thousand here and this is just one room. This one doesn't even have any. Um, I'll grab this. This is a uh, a vertical based flute uh, that I was just using on something a few months ago. Um, That was, that was perfect. Thank you so much for the demonstration. Um, I guess we do have a few more minutes. And so my last question was, you mentioned that you saw um, the capital labor divide as something that was about to disappear. And I would love to. I think it eventually will. Could you talk a little about that? Well, you know, I mean, uh, we don't know for sure how good the robots and the AI algorithms will get. Um, if people are aware of the impact of the data that they're supplying into the algorithms, I think they can get arbitrarily good. And therefore robots can get arbitrarily good. And in that case, in that case, then um, the traditional idea of labor would be different. Instead, what you'd have is a much expanded creative class and that much expanded creative class would make a living from supplying ever-changing cultural driven uh, programming to robots doing all kinds of things. And in that case, it really does start to be hard. You can either say it's a world with only labor because data is labor as Glenn and I put it in an article. Um, I don't think capital makes quite as much sense anymore in that world. I, the, the concept of capital might not quite fit that world, but anyway, capital labor divide starts to fade a little bit. Now, I don't know to what degree we'll actually approach this world. Uh, we might approach it and decide we don't like it and pull away from it. And, but yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think we're somewhat working with an older framework from, uh, uh, that came about from, uh, you know, economists working in the uh, the start of the industrial era and thinking, and, and they were driven by markets and then industrialization as it first appeared. And I think uh, we'll have to change our categories at some point. Okay, thank you. That really clarifies that. Um, and we are right out of time. And so I just okay. wanna encourage everyone who is listening to read Jaren's books. There's so much more in them that we couldn't get even close to talking about today. And they're absolutely wonderful. I'm midway through his most recent book, um, 10 Reasons to Delete Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. So thank you everyone so much for watching and thank you, Jaren, for coming on. All right, good night, take good care. Good night, you too.